If you've been suffering from long COVID, the chances are you've had pretty much every man and his dog telling you that what you really need to be taking to make yourself better is vitamin D or probiotics or some other god awful supplement you've never heard of. Well, it's pretty hard to know what to take when you don't know what's causing the problem, isn't it? And generally speaking, most long haulers have been throwing just about every vitamin and supplement at the wall to see what sticks. And unfortunately, the answer is not much. In this film, I talk to Dr. Tina Pears, one of the leading pack of doctors with a special interest in mast cell activation syndrome. She's been successfully treating patients with MCAS for five years. Might she have some tips? I suspect so. If you've been watching my films on the subject, you'll know long COVID is a bit of a puzzle but we may just have found one of the larger pieces. There's a growing amount of evidence that mast cells may be heavily implicated in many of the symptoms long haulers are experiencing. I asked Dr. Pears if, in her clinical experience and opinion, if the connection of MCAS with long COVID made sense. When you consider our immune response to any infection is through our mast cells predominantly. I mean, there are lots of other cells involved, but it's predominantly through our mast cells. And um, they are activated by infections uh, and then release over a thousand different mediators into the body to help the body respond uh, and fight that infection. So that's what we do when we have infections. And then with MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome, we have patients who have uh, dysfunctional mast cells which overreact to all sorts of stimuli including infections. So when uh, a patient who's got um, MCAS gets an infection they're always ill from the infection and then ill afterwards from the effects of that infection on their mast cells. So it would seem to fit very well with the long COVID picture that patients are, you know, they have COVID but then they grumble on and on and have all these symptoms which they're left with afterwards. So what kind of symptoms are you seeing with the long COVID patients that you've seen, um, which is similar to those that you might see with uh, patients with MCAS? Gosh, well, their profiles are so similar. It's, um, it's just so compelling that the data is, is right, you know, that it's telling us that these patients have got MCAS. So pre predominantly fatigue, that's a big one that almost everybody seems to complain about. Um, headaches is another one. Lots of different IBS symptoms. So that can range from bloating to wind and abdominal pain um, or diarrhea and constipation and fluctuations between the two. Um, and then we've got insomnia and anxiety, uh, rashes. They can have all sorts of different kinds of rashes on the skin. Some are itchy, some are not, but um, a lot of it itchy skin uh, is another complaint. Palpitations, low blood pressure, feeling faint and dizzy, um, shortness of breath. A lot of pa patients, it seems to be their chest that's predominantly troubled by it. Um, things like tinnitus, rhinitis, um, yeah, so many. Weight loss, poor healing. Yeah, I've seen it all. <laughs> the list is huge. You know, one of the most common things that we see um, with long COVID is this um, resistance to exercise, or rather poor tolerance of exercise. Is this something that you see in mast cell activation syndrome, or do you think that might be something else? No, it's something we definitely see in mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, and they, the patients find that if they exert themselves too much, it releases uh, histamine and other mediators into the body from the mast cells. And then they, they pay for their exercise later. Um, and it can, be, it can be immediate or it can be later than that. So sometimes it's the next day that people are absolutely wiped out because they've had a bit of exercise. Do, do people with, um, with MCAS present as what you know with as differently as people with long covid do so obviously there's this sort of this smorgasbord of symptoms um but it's almost like okay pick five pick ten you know and so do patients you know with mcas sort of appear in the same way where some might appear with a different set from this sort of list and as well as others Yes, absolutely. It's totally typical that they are sort of completely different from each other. <laughs> so, and also the same patient can have different symptoms at different times. Uh, and it's, it's almost like sometimes when they're younger, they get certain set of symptoms. And then as they get older, it morphs into something slightly different. But this is very typical of what we see. Um, so yes, and, and I think the long COVID patients have found the same thing. Certainly the long COVID patients that I've been seeing, their profiles definitely fit 
with MCAS. And not only that, um, I was desperate to sort of talk to some long COVID patients um, because I wanted to know what their health was like before they had the COVID infection and then experienced the long COVID. And all of them, I've spoken to, I've had about 15, 16 patients so far come through my clinic and they all got a previous history to suggest that they had MCAS before the COVID. To what degree is MCAS now accepted by the sort of the general medical community? Well, um, it's getting better, but it's not great. <laughs> so so um, most, of, most of the patients I've been seeing over the last five years with MCAS and diagnosing coincidentally most of the time. So they've come to see me for contraception or for menopause um, advice. And then when I take full history, I say, well, I think you've got something else going on here and, and go into, into that history. Um, and then I write to their GPs and so often, 99.9% .9 of the time, the GPs never actually heard of it. Um, and that creates a, a little bit of difficulty for the patient, sometimes trying to get the medication uh, and to get it right. But m gradually over the last five years, that is improving as POTS is discussed more and Ehlers Danlos is discussed more. And the RCGP have actually got a, um, a toolkit now uh, for Ehlers Danlos. And inside that toolkit, it mentions MCAS and it has some references to it. So that, that is brilliant. If the GPs are aware of that document, then they can go and have a look at that. So things are improving, but it's very, very slow. What treatments have you seen provide the best results for the patients you've seen who've had MCAS? Right. So there's the basic first thing that it's important for patients to do, I believe, is to get off high histamine foods. Because one of the um, one of the amines that are released by the mast cells is histamine, and when histamine goes up, it causes a big inflammatory response in the body. And unfortunately, not only do we make and store histamine in our mast cells, in our basophils, our platelets, and our neurons, and also in some cells in our stomach, which help release acid, and that helps with um, protein digestion. So not only are we making and storing it, but we're also eating it in various foods. And some foods are very, very high in histamine. Um, and there are certain drinks that can also block the enzymes that actually break down the histamine to prevent you overdosing on histamine from your food. Now, um, some, quite a few of my patients, they get into difficulty with MCAS because they are trying to get healthy and they're eating healthy food, which of course it is, but it's full of histamine and so it's sort of tripping them up. So in particular, things like, um, like uh, avocados, tomatoes, spinach, bananas, um, and then if they drink tea and coffee and green tea and alcohol, that actually blocks the, one of the enzymes that breaks down the histamine. So they can get into real difficulties. Processed food is no good. Reheated food, leftovers is no good. Um, you know, TV dinners are no good. So I'm afraid it's, that that's the first thing we need to address is the diet to try and reduce the amount of histamine that's coming in the body so we're not constantly adding to this uh, already high histamine level, which is so toxic. Um, and then the next thing is for them to, um, to take uh, quite a few vitamins and minerals. And, um, and I've told you about these already, so that you're, you know what I mean, it's quite a few, but they really are helpful. So things like a reasonably high dose vitamin D, uh, very important. We uh, vitamin C, a slow release vitamin C, seven hundred and fifty milligrams a day, or a thousand milligrams three times a day. Vitamin C is actually a very good antihistamine, so it helps to start to lower that uh, in the in the body. Um, to take niacin vitamin b3 and it has to be the niacin type um, by the no flush variety otherwise it makes you sort of flush when you take it and that um, should be taken every day that's very important uh, also um, zinc 15 to 30 milligrams a day and quercetin uh, which can should be taken three times a day now these are all things that patients can buy over the counter selenium is also good um, and that could be a couple of Brazil nuts a day, which are actually have no histamine in them, which is great. Or, um, or to get uh, a zinc, uh, sorry, a selenium uh, supplement, and that would be 100 micrograms a day. So um, it's really important that patients can do this straight away and they can get themselves on these supplements to help support their system and their methylation pathways and the way they handle uh, waste, waste in their body and so on. So that's very important. And then they could buy an over-the-counter antihistamine. 
and um, it's trial and error with all the MCAS patients, it's trial and error. Um, so it's, we have this sort of, um, uh, we, we say go low and slow. So start with a small dose, if you're okay with it, and you've taken it once that day, and it's okay the next day, if the dose is to take it twice, then take it twice the next day and so on. So you do it gradually. We find that a lot of MCAS patients are very sensitive to excipients contained in various different preparations. So they're fine with the actual drug. It's the make of the drug maybe that has certain additives that are upsetting them. So um, it's worth their while trying different makes if they feel that one make doesn't suit them. And the over-the-counter antihistamines are type one antihistamines, and they um, they should they on the box it'll say take once a day, but actually we need them to be taken two or three times a day um, to help with the with this condition. And then it's good if they can also get an anti a type two antihistamine, which has to be prescribed by a GP or a, a, a doctor. Um, and that would be, at the moment, for motidine is the one that's available in the UK. And that would be 40 milligrams a day of that. Um, and then also there are some mast cell stabilizers which can help, which would need a prescription. So they do need to see a doctor about those. Um, there are a few other things that we can try, um, but they are sort of, for, you know, if those initial, that initial, initial approach hasn't worked so well. But a lot of it's trial and error. Have you seen a difference between the MCAS people and the long COVID people in terms of how they've responded to this? Um, it varies, uh, is the answer to that. I think the long COVID patients are taking longer to respond. That's my feeling, but it's early days yet, so yeah. I'm not sure. Um, I have had a few of the long COVID patients who felt very much better just for changing their diet and taking some vitamins. Um, so uh, we, we're all going to, I think everyone is um, different in their response to how bad they are. Some people have got more minor symptoms than others. Um, and obviously the more seriously um, sick patients are going to take longer for their systems to settle down. The other worry I have is that actually some of them could still have the virus um, present. As you know, we saw that paper, didn't we? Um, which suggested that 50% of the patients six months after getting over COVID still had it in cells in their gut. And uh, that's of concern because if that is the case, that's going to be keeping their mast cells activated and it could be a longer road to recovery. Can you tell me a little bit about this app that you've recently been involved in, in rolling out um, and how it helps patients? Yes, the, the app is called People With, and that's written as one word. And it's a, I was using it in my clinics for my menopause patients and my patients with MCAS and histamine intolerance, because it is a very, very useful tool for patients to be able to track their symptoms. So that it, it's, um, they can download, the, put their symptoms in, and then every day they can track in or uh, sort of check in every day or every other day and say, well, what was the headache like? And so on. And you can also put in your lifestyle and uh, supplements, and it will remind you to take your medication and and um, etc. So it's a, patients have found it very useful. It can, they can also download a report and then send it to their doctors to look at to see how things are improving or otherwise. Um, and so it's been very, very helpful from that point of view. Um, we, we, start, we started using the app specifically for long COVID patients as well, because we felt we wanted to see what their profiles and whether their profiles did match the MCAS patient profile. And over 2000 have downloaded it, for which I'm very grateful, because it has allowed us to see that absolutely the list of symptoms that they um, have put into the app absolutely match um, MCAS patient symptoms. Um, and actually on average, they have seven symptoms each, which is no, <laughs> terrible, but that fits with MCAS too. We see people with multiple symptoms. So it's been very, very useful from that point of view. Um, and, um, and I'm hoping as we go forward that we might be able to sort of see if there's any chance that there are different profiles which can be helped in different ways. Um, and that's another sort of piece of work to be done, really, because it may be that whilst um, everyone does seem to have variable symptoms, there, is a, there could be a pattern that we could pick up and say, well, actually these patients responded really well to this particular vitamin or this particular combination of treatments. And actually that's the kind of profile they had. I don't know, that may not be the case, but it'd be very interesting to see. Um, so finally, if you could commission a research project into long COVID tomorrow, what would it be? 
Right. Well, I've got two, actually. I hope you don't That's fine, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one would be to see if it still is present in gut cells of the yeah. small intestine. So I'm afraid that means some biopsies for some people. Yeah. But I think it's a piece of work that we really need to do to try and understand what's going on as best we can. And the other one would be to actually look at the genetics of the long COVID patients and see whether um, they have got any sort of similar traits going on between them. Just one more thought. Is there anything you can say? Because obviously, you know, the life cycle of a mast cell is sort of six months. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you can say about the way that when you've seen people with MCAS before, how when it comes to recovery or managing this, is there something yeah. tied into that period of time that you see as yeah. well? Yes, definitely. So mast cells do uh, last about six months. So that means every month you're replacing one sixth of them. Now, if in the MCAS and HIP patients, if we can give them a lower histamine environment, a calmer environment that isn't stimulating their mast cells quite so much, the new ones that are being made seem to behave better than the old ones <laughs> who have been really sort of hypersensitized by the high histamine environment. And um, so six months on, if we can be good with the diet and we can do the treatments and do the vitamins and minerals and so on, six months later, often the patients are in a much calmer patch, uh, which makes you know, their, their lives and the quality of their life much, much better. So as we've already probably figured out, there is no magic bullet. My personal feeling is that long COVID is not entirely MCAS, but for many long haulers, it may be a very large part of the puzzle and treating it correctly could lead to a significant improvement in symptoms. The fact is, as I've previously shown with my research, there is a very high incidence of ATP and autoimmune conditions amongst long haulers, and those conditions are inherently mast cell related. So for those of you who do have hay fever, asthma, eczema, arthritis, and potentially IBS and GI conditions too, uh, some of these measures could really be quite beneficial. So just to recap, it's kind of a four point process. Uh, firstly, diet. Uh, avoid high histamine foods uh, and minimize the intake of drinks or food uh, that stop your body breaking the histamine down. Unfortunately for me, that means no more mainlining tea. Secondly, uh, supplements. Uh, here are the main ones. Uh, it's possible that even with no pharmacological interventions, uh, these supplements could make quite a big difference by themselves. Thirdly, over-the-counter drugs such as antihistamines. Uh, it might be a little bit of trial and error to find uh, the right type that work for you. Uh, and it's okay to take a, a one-a-day antihistamine two or three times a day. Uh, and in fact, you should. Fourthly, prescription drugs, uh, H2 antagonists and mast cell stabilizers or inhibitors. Uh, you'll need to speak to your GP about those. And then finally, patients. Don't expect to be better tomorrow, uh, but create the conditions for those new mast cells to be formed in a somewhat calmer environment. And in the meantime, uh, I'll keep digging into the research and perhaps, hopefully fairly soon, we'll have an answer to that persistent virus question too. Till next time.